In introducing this sermon this morning, I would like to read several scriptures, beginning in the book of Psalms 51 and verse number 6. The psalmist declared, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And then if you turn on over into the 119th Psalm and verse number 30, we have this particular comment regarding the truth. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before thee. Then when you come into the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said to the church in Ephesus in chapter 4 and verse 15 that we were to speak the truth in love. I make this comment regarding that. It certainly it means the one that is speaking the truth is to love God and love the souls of men that he speaks the truth to. But it also means that he loves the truth he speaks. And that's an important point. It doesn't allow for any compromise in the truth. Then in a familiar passage in 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy first, 1 Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul wrote to Timothy saying that if he tarried long, that Timothy might know how to behave himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And then in the second letter, chapter 2 and verse 15, he admonishes Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then James writes to Christians in James 5 and verse 19, saying, if any err from the truth that we are to be a part of converting that person and saving him. I hope you see in both the Old and New Testaments the emphasis that is given to the truth. And of course this is spiritual truth. We're not talking about the truth necessarily about geography or physics or chemistry or history save as it relates to, and the Bible reveals it, to the unfolding of how God saves men. You will see then that the attitude that we ought to have toward the truth is set out clearly in Proverbs 23 and verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now these are just a smattering of the scriptures that emphasize the importance of truth and how important truth should be in your life and mine. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in his prayer on the night before his crucifixion in John 17, 17, he prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth, Thy word is truth. Thus, uh, when you go back over to Paul's admonition and charge to Timothy to preach the word, well, that's synonymous with preaching the truth. And thus, when you study, make a word study of the word truth, then you see that we must, it's incumbent upon us, it's obligatory, obligatory upon us to know the truth of the gospel. To know the truth God's revealed concerning man's state and how he would save man and how we're saved and just when our sins are forgiven. What we're seeing specifically in Proverbs 23, 23 where he says, buy the truth and sell it not, is this. Whether the truth may cost us our time, our money, our lands, our houses, our families, our friends, our physical suffering. It's all well worth the price. And once obtained, the Proverbs writer indicates, it should not be sold for anything. 
So, this should cause us to honestly look into our lives as to how much we prize the truth. The truth as it relates to the forgiveness of our sins and living the Christian life. Now, in this day and age, there's so much said about truth. And because the Word of God re regarding our salvation is truth, it bears all the marks of what truth is. It corresponds with reality. It's objective. That is, it doesn't depend upon how old you are, young you are, whether you're male or female, rich or poor, or what the race you are, or ethnic background, or anything like that, for it to be true. Truth is just what it is. Thus it corresponds with reality. And so the truth of Jesus Christ relative to our salvation bears that mark of what truth is. It's objective, it's absolute, and it's humanly attainable. Now God created us in such a way as to attain the truth through the processes whereby we as humans operate to learn anything. And so we must know the truth of the gospel in order to be saved from our sins. We cannot uh, know error and think it's the truth and be saved. We must know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about those things that pertain to our forgiveness of sins and living the faithful Christian life. Truth is absolutely necessary in the practice of pure and undefiled religion. Now, it matters very little what we think, what we feel, what we imagine, what we suppose or would like to believe. It's the truth as it is in the words of truth that make the difference. I may say, well, I would like it to be this way, and I think that it is. But if it doesn't correspond with the truth that's in the Word of God, then it's not really and actually the truth. It's error. Also, you can know a whole lot and not know all you need to know. Apollos was one of those people. Apollos knew a lot of other people didn't know and... They needed to know it, and he was preaching it to them. And the Scripture says of his ability that he was an eloquent man. It says also that he was mighty in the Scriptures. Now that's interesting. An eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures, teaching people what he knew that they didn't know, and they needed to know, but he didn't know enough. He didn't know enough. He was very fervent in spirit. Evidently, he was bold in his proclamation of what he knew, and he was convincing as far as those who listened to him. However, he lacked one thing which all need in order to be successful in preaching. The whole truth. It seems to me that some people, and not a few of my brethren at times, Think that because somebody believes in God, believes in Christ the Son of God, and the Savior of the world, believes in the Bible as the Word of God, and believes many of the truths of the Bible, that makes them fully acceptable to God. Well, if that was the case, then you had that in the devout Jews on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, before they heard the gospel. But they didn't know enough. They didn't have all of the truth on the subject. And yet to hear some people speak today, well, he knows some truth, it must be all right. No, it's not. Whatever is necessary to salvation, you need to know all truth about it. Now you say, well, I, I don't understand that. Well, can you know part of the plan of salvation to be saved? Or must you need to know all of the plan of salvation to be saved? It's that simple. You'll remember that it was Priscilla and Aquila who took Apollos aside. They knew more than he did. And they taught him the way of the Lord more accurately. That is, they gave him further knowledge of the truth. He didn't know it. They recognized it by what he preached. So they took him aside and taught him the way of truth more accurately. Acts 18, 24 through 28. That tells us a lot of things. It means that when we stand here such as I'm standing here and say, you know, I'm preaching the truth, it means that you have an obligation to yourself and to God and even to me to be studying your Bible right along with me. 
Well, I've known a lot of folks that I've learned from and cherished them highly. Probably know more of the Bible I ever will know. But they may have erred on certain things, not intending to. Maybe it was a misstatement. And being human, we do that now and then, you know. And so it is that we need to study for ourselves. Study what? The truth. Thus, we need to learn how the Bible reveals the truth relative to our salvation. And we need to study it daily. There are many deceivers in our religious world today. It's sort of amazing to me. All my life, I've heard people preach the Bible and point out the scriptures in both the Old and New Testaments that there are many false prophets. There are many deceivers. There's all sorts of wrong doctrines purporting to be the truth. And yet one of the things I've noticed about a lot of folks, you never can find a certain person with a name and an address who is a false teacher, at least as far as some people are concerned. Well, that's because too many times we have our favorites. Somebody knows a lot of the truth and they've taught it, but maybe they embrace a certain false doctrine. I think I can use an example of that. The late brother James D. Bales I had in school. I prize his works. I have many of his books, and he wrote a host of them. And yet he was wrong when it came to the matter of saying people outside the church in the world are not amenable to the whole doctrine of Christ. And he did that. Well, he, that meant that a person living in adultery, well, that's all right. They can be baptized without breaking up that adulterous union and still be okay. The truth on marriage, divorce, remarriage only applies to the member of the church. Well, that's wrong, folks. Just as wrong as wrong could be. However, he still probably knew more about a lot of things in the Bible than I did. And thus, I still consult his works. But I studied for myself, and I found out he was wrong on that point. And every good commentary we have written by a conservative denominationist, we recognize they didn't, didn't understand the truth of the Bible about denominationalism or about how a person is saved or when a person is saved. We recognize that in their good scholarly comments, they have strong biases in favor of error. And thus, we look for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on everything. That's our goal, by the truth. Not part of it or most of it, but by the truth and sell it not. Listen to Ephesians 4 and verse 14. While the New Testament was still being written down, Paul, an apostle of Christ, said to the church at Ephesus in verse 14 that we would receive the truth of God, that's why we have the New Testament, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by the slight of men. He said, whereby in cunning craftiness they lie in wait to deceive. It seems to be a hard thing for some of my brethren to read this, acknowledge what it says, and yet still realize that in the church there can be those who are that dishonest that they actually are lying in wait like a robber on the side of the road for the stagecoach to come along, then to surprise them and steal what's on it. But that's what the good book says. It means what it says, says what it means now, and it won't change on the day of judgment. It's there to warn us. It's there to guide us. It shows us the need of being vigilant and circumspect in all our dealings. Now the word slight here is from a Greek word, kubos, and it means a cube. And why a cube? Because it referenced dice playing and the cheating that went on in a dice game. So it is metaphorically referring to deception. And that tells you that 2,000 years ago, those who through the dice were apt to be uh, cheats and frauds when it comes to their fellow players. So like people who find themselves victims of professional gamblers, so are the unlearned before the winds of error. Dishonesty and trickery are the name of the game when it comes to false teachers. If you read Paul's teaching about the very character of a rank false teacher in 1 Timothy 4, you know that a person like that doesn't give a hoot what you think as long as he can milk something out of him, you need his money. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means the Spirit's speaking, he speaks words, and he speaks it plainly. That's the idea of expressly. 
that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now that means they had it or they couldn't leave it. The faith is the New Testament system, thus they were involved in it. They'd been saved by believing and obeying it, but now they were departing from it. Well, now what caused them to depart from it? How could they once know the truth, embrace it, live it, and then leave it? They gave heed to seducing uh, devils and doctrines of devils, seducing spirits, doctrines of demons or devils. And notice that these fellows spoke in hypocrisy. Their conscience was seared as with a hot iron. And then he tells some of the false doctrines they would teach. In other words, these fellows had reached the stage where their conscience didn't bother them to tell a lie. No, they were telling a lie. And they actually connived to sell the thing to the people. I remember just a few years ago regarding change agents, agents of change, as they would seek to change the church. And one of their advisors told them, push, 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 until they push back, then take two steps back until they get used to the, what you've already accomplished, and then push a little further. And of course, after a while, you've gone right over the brink. Now, is that counsel as to how to inject a doctrine in that was not acceptable to the group you were trying to get it into? Why, of course it is. It's not a matter of truth to them. It's a matter of gradually getting people used to it. You know, the old frog in the water, the water warms up so slowly that it can finally boil to death and it doesn't even know it's stewing in its own juices. Well, that's the way false teachers work. And the way Paul describes the character of those people, the heart of those people, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, it's obvious they have no honest bone about them. They're simply out for what they can get. So dishonesty and trickery are the name of the game for these people. In chapter 4 and verse 15, he says, and we referred to this a while ago, Paul does, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Well, how are you going to grow up to him in all things? If you don't know the truth, know that you know it, know that you have all of it on the subject, and you're in submission to whatever demands the truth makes out of your life, and you know that's being faithful and demonstrating your love of God. You can't love God and not love the things of God. If you love God, you love His Word. And you bear with things. You work through things without corrupting yourself with those things. So we need to guard against those who lie in wait with one desire in mind to deceive. Let's continue to speak the truth in love, in love of God and in love of the truth and love of the people we speak it to, that those who are Christians may grow up in Christ, spiritually speaking, and those not Christians may know what to do to be saved from their sins. Also, let's not think that by ignoring, ignoring someone's error, we're being kind to them. That's not kindness, the way the Bible defines kindness, and it's not kindness exemplified in the life of Christ. I wish we would sit down and just study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how Jesus dealt with people in error. I think you'd find that he'd be treated today by people just like he was treated then because he didn't pull any punches. He stated it just like it was to people. We've been sold this false view that we're trying to find some particular little inroad into them to where we just can't state something. Well, you know, I may not be able to teach a whole Bible class on a subject or several Bible classes on it, but I can tell you what I believe. It's reported that Brother N.B. Hardiman, many, many years ago, president of Freed Hardiman College, the old Freed Hardiman College, that he wrote back on somebody, to somebody regarding Freed Hardiman's position on this subject. And he made it clear that I can write it on the back of a penny postcard that tells you how long ago that was and still have room to say and how's your Aunt Sally folks I don't have to be able to show her proof in the book and study with you for hours before I can tell you what I believe do you believe that it's uh, right to use mechanical instruments of music and the worship of God no was that hard 
Do you believe that a person is a Christian like the New Testament defines the word Christian? Without being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins? How hard is this? No. Well, that's being awful bold, frank, and haughty, <clears throat> and judgmental. You know, it seems to me, and some of you my age thereabouts remember this, it's still used that way. Do you remember back in the 60s the overworked word relevant? Well, judgmental ought to be right up there beside it. It's not relevant. Well, it's you're being judgmental. Brethren, I wish I could just get those folks to say you're be, that, that say you're being judgmental because you state where you, your position to realize they're being judgmental in telling me I'm judgmental. Now that's just ignoramus is going to see. Do you believe that you've worshipped like God says the church ought to do on the first day of the week when you leave out the Lord's Supper? No. Do you believe that you can live a faithful Christian life and not study your Bible? No. And you can go right on down the line. Now, the next question I would say to folks is, would you like to understand why I don't believe that or I do believe, whatever it may be? You see, we could even learn that one of the ways we can get people's attention is to be plain, and then maybe they would say, well, why do you believe that? Then I can say, if you really want to know, we can study the Bible and learn. Now, one thing about that, if they don't have enough interest to say, well, why do you believe that? Then that pretty well told you they don't really have much interest, period. <laughs> When it comes to a man going to heaven or hell, it seems to me he ought to take a little interest in what's going on when it relates to that. So we need to be sure that we know we're not kind to people by just ignoring the error in their lives, especially our brothers and sisters in the church. The truth, and only the truth, can make us free from the bondage of the traditions and doctrines of sin. That's all there is to it. If somebody says, well, I know I'm a Christian. Because back here, as soon as I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, I became a Christian. Oh, were you baptized? Yeah, I was baptized to show as an outward sign of an inward grace that saved me back before I was baptized. Is, does that make me a Christian? I promise you right now some of my brethren would not want to answer that. We've listened far too long with the politicians in our country. We can't give a definitive answer. We can be just political in those things. We don't want, I don't want my family not to like me. I don't want my friends not to like me. Somebody asks you that question, the only answer you can give them in, in view of what the Bible teaches, the totality of the Bible's information is, no, you're not a Christian. Think of the people right now worshiping God who are not even Christians, but they think they are. And the Lord's church in general has reached a stage of apostasy to where we don't want our preachers even saying anything that makes people in denominations to think they're not even Christians. And that's a sad day indeed. If anyone has been overtaken by error, then we have referred you already to James 5. We commented about it, verse 19. But notice that that's a person that's been overtaken in error. That person was, in those days, a member of the church. We have an obligation as those not overtaken in a trespass. We have an obligation to those brethren who are overtaken in a trespass. Here's a plain statement. Brethren, okay, do we not understand that's members of the church? If it's conditional, any of you, you who, brethren, do err, err from what? The truth. And one, convert him. Well, 
the one converting must be somebody that's not been overtaken in error and is interested in changing the one overtaken in error back to the truth. Then here's what that person needs to know who does the converting. Let him know that he which converted the sinner. Well, a person can become a Christian, be overtaken in a trespass, and the Bible calls that a brother or sister a sinner. From the error of his way, what happens when you do that? Shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. James 5, 19 and 20. How can a multitude of sins be hidden when that person is converted to the truth? They leave the error that they've been caught up in and they come back to the truth, whatever subject it is. It's that simple. But now it's not that simple when it comes to the person who has a stubborn will to persist in whatever it is, whatever error it is that they're in. You may be able to show from the Bible in various ways that what you now hold is error. That person, for various reasons, may not repent of it. Well, they remain lost. We must understand that. Over the years, and now it's the end of this month, it's about now, it's been 49 years when I mark my time of standing up the first time and trying to present a lesson. I always like to say, and you've heard me say it, I called it a sermon, whether anybody else did or not. And all through those years, I've watched brethren get caught up in error and other brethren take up for them. I don't understand that. Don't understand it. I didn't understand it when I was 18. I don't understand it at 67. You know, that's a long time not to understand something. But that's just the truth of the matter. Brethren who are brethren who know what to do to become members of the church, who know the simplicity of what it is to live the Christian life when they're overtaken in a trespass, and faithful brethren show them they're their ways. Now just how long does it take to get that person to repent? Sometimes we're overtaken in a trespass and going beyond what the Scriptures teach and our so-called long-suffering. The long suffering has degenerated into tolerance and is no longer suffering long with the person. The truth, well, buy the truth, whatever you got to pay for it, how much it costs you, and never turn loose of it, never sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now, this, of course, lays down basically what would be in a syllogism the major premise. It states the principle or it states the truth. Now the second part of it, the minor premise, is whether you get down to who's doing it. I often say that most of our preaching today is uh, major premise preaching. And we don't get much around to who we're talking about. That's the minor premise. Let me see if I can illustrate it in one I've used multiplicity of times. Saul of Tarsus in the process of becoming a Christian repented of his sins. Well, that's the minor premise. The major premise would be this. The scriptures teach that in the process of becoming a Christian, one must repent of his sins. See, that states the truth of the New Testament and one of the steps of the plan of salvation. But when you get down to that second premise, you've selected a particular person. And you pointed out that that person in the process of becoming a Christian met or took that step in the plan of salvation. A whole host of my preaching brethren think they preach the whole counsel of God because they spend their time showing you the requirements of the Bible. It must be done. It's necessary. It's part of preaching the whole counsel of God. But where they fail is when they don't preach sermons and says this means you. And that's where so many back off and show they really don't love the Lord and they don't preach the truth in love. Well, I realize that you can't know everything there is about a person. God and that person must be the one to fully respond out of honesty and love of the truth to whatever is preached. So God expects a person then, some, well, not sometimes, but all the time, 
to apply the truth to their lives. You can do that better than I can. When you consider what it is when Paul withstood Peter to the face, he knew, as well as Peter or anybody else that was present in that situation, that Peter had sinned. Thus, he could approach him and say, Peter, I'm talking about you. You're the one that did it, and you led other people away. All the time, you can't do that. A lot of the time, you must preach the truth and say, now, does this apply to you? Because only you can know, and God knows that it applies to you, and you need to do the changing. But whatever takes place, whether it's major premise, as I call it, preaching, or minor premise, where this means you preaching, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth must be preached. The whole counsel of God must be preached. And to the hearers who are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, they want it that way. They want it that way. So as we conclude, we note that to disregard, to neglect, to ignore, to reject, to shun, or deny the truth will prove fatal to souls. And in fact, it's the only thing that can produce such a spiritual fatality. So we need to have a genuine love of the truth and we have to ask ourselves, do I really love the truth? And I'm going to follow it wherever it leads me, sacrificing whatever has to be. So do I love the truth? Do I daily seek, give a diligent search of patient inquiry to be thoroughly acquainted with it? For only the truth can make us free and lead us to the joys of heaven. Only the truth, nothing else. Error sincerely held is still error. We must sincerely hold to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We studied a moment ago what it takes to become a Christian. One must believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, repent of his sins, confess his faith in Christ as the Son of God, and then be complete the obedience of the plan of salvation by being immersed in water to obtain the remission of sins by the authority of Christ. There's no other way. That is the plan of salvation. If you'd like to study more about each step in it, that's fine. But that's the plan of salvation. If you have not from the heart done that, you're still lost in your sins. And if you die in that shape, there's no hope for you. There's just simply eternity in a devil's hell. As a child of God, you should be cultivating that love for the truth that you had when you heard and obeyed the gospel. And thus you should grow in Christ and knowledge and practice of it. But if you have wandered away from it, known only to you and God, take care of it there. Repent of it. Confess that sin to God and pray for forgiveness. But if your sin has been of a public nature, bringing reproach on the blood-bought body of Christ, you need to confess that repented of sin in so far as you can to make it public, to let people know you're ashamed of that activity. You renounce it and you're turning away from it. And you're no longer going to live that way. And we'll pray with you and for you that God forgive you. And the words of the scripture says he will. So the invitation of Jesus Christ is once again offered. Will this be the last opportunity you have to obey the gospel or repent of your sins? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. If you're subject to the call of Jesus Christ our Lord, come now while we stand and sing.